In the previous episode, you heard how the Greeks believed our universe, their gods and goddesses and humans were created. You also learned that humans were punished for their curiosity, thanks to Pandora. And thanks to Prometheus, they were punished for their advantage towards other animals, to become creators themselves with the help of fire. According to Hesiod, there were multiple ages of humans, the Golden, the Silver, and the Bronze Age. In the Bronze Age, humans were tough, they lacked compassion and only cared about war. Their time ended with a great flood, an event that we see being repeated in most mythologies in the Mediterranean region. What followed was a great era, the heroic age, during which humans progressed into superhumans. Some of them, such as Heracles, had one divine and one mortal parent, and they possessed many of their godly parents' qualities and superpowers. Although they were mortals, they had a special place in Hades, which was called the Elysian Fields. Heroes and heroines often inspired their own cults and were worshipped by ancient Greeks as if they were gods. Perhaps because, since Greek gods were the personification of higher values, heroes made Theoses the unification with these higher values possible. It is worth mentioning that there are great disputes concerning whether some of these heroes were people who did in fact exist in history, or even if they did exist, if they did the things we know through the mythical stories. This is something to keep in mind, since history often blends with mythology. Although heroes were often born possessing incredible qualities, they had to work hard towards earning this title. They had to use both their mind and body to help others, to fight monsters and inner demons, and, most importantly, to discover themselves and the true purpose of life. And they also learned not to try to exceed their powers and challenge the power of the gods, which would result in Hebrews the name given to describe divine punishment for one's arrogance. In order to be a hero, you have to stay grounded. Flying too close to the sun, such as Zicarus, who escaped the Minon labyrinth with wings made of wax, will result to your downfall. Heroes and heroines were perhaps the opposite of hedonists. They lived for a greater purpose, and they did not fear pain. Heracles, for example, was once visited by vice and virtue, as the historian and philosopher Xenophon of Athens once wrote. Vice offered him an easy life full of pleasures, while virtue promised him a life full of hardships and obstacles, which would, however, be truly meaningful. Hercules chose the second option, and indeed, this saved him from his own madness, a madness that goddess Hera had caused him to suffer. Could the hero's journey be perhaps the cure to our mental suffering? Greek heroes and heroines inspired the hero archetype in psychology and the so-called hero's journey in comparative mythology and narratology. These myths were analyzed by Carl Jung, Joseph Campbell, and other academics who were intrigued by the many stories of heroes in all mythologies. The hero's journey begins with a call for an adventure. The hero finds many obstacles and temptations, receives punishment or aid from gods, and even goes into the world of the dead where he is reborn. He then returns home completely transformed. Ancient Greek stories that narrated such heroic journeys were often called epics or epic poems. There were lengthy narratives about the extraordinary lives of heroes, and in the beginning, they were all memorized and spread by word of mouth. That is because they originated before the invention of writing, 
but survived through the writings of ancient authors. It's worth noting that heroes are often coming face to face with the so-called Dark Father, the archetype we saw in the myths of Uranus and Cronus. The Dark Father represents absolute order. He fears chains and tries to stop the creative side of the universe from giving birth to new ideas, often by eating them whole. Heroes are not only called to eradicate these tyrants, similarly to how Luke had to face Darth Vader in Star Wars, but to become positive leaders themselves by balancing order and chaos, just like Simba did in Disney's Lion King. As you may have already guessed, the impact the ancient Greek myths had on the Western culture can't be counted. In this episode, you will hear the summary of Homer's epic named The Odyssey. The episode also includes the adventurous Argonautica and the Twelve Labors of Heracles. But before we get started, let's see some of the mightiest Greek heroes and heroines, including some that won't be included in these stories. In the Homeric epic poem The Iliad, we learn about Achilles, a great hero of the Trojan War and perhaps the greatest of all Greek warriors. As we know from Homer, he was the son of the Nereid Thetis and King Peleus of the Myrmidons. Thetis was actually meant to marry Zeus, but according to a prophecy, you guessed it, their son would become greater than the father and Zeus didn't want to risk that. Therefore, she married a mortal and had Achilles. But Thetis wanted an immortal son. That is why she took baby Achilles to a sacred river named Styx, which was one of the many natural boundaries between the world of the living and Hades, the world of the dead. Thetis then dipped the baby into the river, hoping that it would make him immortal. Indeed, the quick dive worked out, but Achilles had one weak spot, his heel, from which his mother held him while he was dipped into the waters. And now you know where the term Achilles heel comes from. A lesser known monster slayer in ancient Greek mythology is perhaps Perseus, founder of Mycenae. He was the son of Zeus with a mortal Danae, who was locked in a bronze chamber because her father feared that if she had intimate relations, she would give birth to a child that would question his power, a motif we see in most myths. The mighty hero had many adventures, but he is known for the destruction of a terrifying monster and the act of saving a damsel in distress. Perseus was the one who managed to kill Gorgon Medusa, who would petrify, literally petrify, humans with her terrifying appearance. Perseus used an adamantine sword and Hades' helm of darkness, along with Hermes' winged sandals and a polished shield that had a mirroring effect. Perseus managed to petrify the Gorgon with her own reflection and protected himself with a helm of darkness. He then quickly flew towards her and cut her head with hairs made of serpents, using his sword made of diamonds. Gorgon Medusa's head was then used by Theseus as a weapon to turn his enemies into stone. Perseus also visited Ethiopia with the help of a winged horse named Pegasus. There, he saved Princess Andromeda before she was sacrificed to a beast named Kytus to appease Poseidon. Just like St. George, Perseus killed the serpentine monster, a symbol of our primal fears, and as with most fairy tales, the princess and the hero got married. Another brave hero in ancient Greek mythology is, of course, Theseus. The hero had to complete a series of labors to become the next king of Athens. He visited six entrances to the underworld that were each guarded by a chthonic enemy, and he managed to defeat them all. 
One of his enemies was perhaps an ancient Greek version of a serial killer. Procrustes, the stretcher, would abduct travelers who wandered in the plains of the seas and laid them on a bed. If his victim was too tall to fit the bed, he would cut his limbs off. If he or she was too short, he would stretch them to fit the bed, causing them to die slowly and painfully. Another enemy would be an enormous pig that terrified the people of Attica, and a robber who fed his victims to a giant turtle. Theseus became the rightful prince of Athens, and King Aegeus recognized him as his son. Theseus was indeed his long-lost son he had never met, who ended up proving himself with his great deeds. As soon as Theseus became the prince of Athens, he wanted to end a horrible custom that included the sacrificial offering of young Athenian men and women to a beast in Crete. The Minotaur was a human-like gigantic bull that resided at the labyrinth of King Minos. In fact, the beast was the son of King Minos's wife, who had an obscure attraction to bulls and would often mate with them. The Athenians were sending their youths to Minos to avoid a war against Crete. Theseus managed to kill the Minotaur with the help of King Minos's daughter, Ariadne, who had fallen in love with him. Ariadne had offered him a ball of thread that would help him navigate inside the labyrinth. She then fled with him, but Theseus ended up abandoning Ariadne on the island of Naxos. And he also ended up causing his father to fall to his death. Theseus was too excited to win against the monster, but he had forgotten to change the vessel's sails from black to white, causing Aeus, who watched the ships from afar, to think he died in Crete. Pelerophon is another Greek hero. Years before the days of Heracles, he was a great monster slayer along Perseus. The man who was from Corinth and the son of god Poseidon, is responsible for killing Himera, a terrifying monster with the head of a lion in Anatolia. Bellerophon managed to kill the beast by riding the flying horse Pegasus, which he had managed to tame. Bellerophon ended up dying after falling from his flying horse from a great height. After killing Himera, his arrogance grew, and he decided to fly up to Mount Olympus and meet the gods. But with such an act, he committed Hebris and fell to his death. Just like another hero named Icarus, who, along with his father Daedalus, had used his wittiness to escape the Cretan labyrinth of horrors. Icarus flew with wings made of wax, which melted as soon as he approached the sun. The hero never listened to his father's words and overestimated his own powers. Another hero of ancient Greek mythology is Jason. He was the husband of Medea who helped him acquire the golden fleece of Colchis. In order to acquire the fleece and become the rightful king of Iolcos, Jason found the bravest men and women of Greece, including Heracles and Atalanta and sails towards the Black Sea with a legendary vessel known as Argo. His adventures are described in the epic named Argonautica, which we will see in detail. But as you may have noticed, I mentioned that one of Jason's companions was a woman named Atalanta. She is perhaps one of the few female heroines of ancient Greek mythology. She was a huntress from Arcadia and a favorite of goddess Artemis. Atalanta was left on a mountain by her father, who wanted a son. However, a group of hunters later found her and raised her as their own. The heroine is known for killing men and supernatural beings that attacked her in the woods and for being a brave Argonaut, fighting beasts towards her way to Colchis. She is also known for winning a fight against another hero named Peleus, but mostly for completing an impossible task. Atalanta managed to kill the Caledonian boar, 
a gigantic pig that terrified the kingdom of Calidon for years, with the help, of course, of some other hunters. Another mighty Argonaut is perhaps the most well-known Greek hero, Heracles, the son of Zeus, who was the target of Hera, but managed to survive and save the world. You may know him as Hercules and as the owner of Pegasus. However, Heracles never wrote Pegasus, in ancient Greek mythology at least. His real name was Alcaeus, and he was the son of Zeus. He had a twin brother from a mortal father as well. He was targeted by Hera in his crib, who left a gigantic snake next to him. He managed to save him and his brother by killing the snakes with his bare hands as a newborn baby. And as an adult, Heracles was targeted again by Hera, who calls him madness. He killed his wife and sons in a feast of anger. And that caused him to lose the throne of Tyrins in Argolis, to his archenemy, Evristheus. In order to regain his power, he had to complete a series of labors, including killing a lion in a mare and slaying the nine-headed Hydra in a swamp named Lerna. His supernatural powers caused many Greeks to worship him as a god. And now, we should of course remember the glorious hero who was not only brave and strong, but also extremely smart. We are talking about Odysseus, who you may know as Ulysses, which is his Latin name. Odysseus was the legendary king of Ithaca, who found a way to help the Greeks sneak into the Trojan palace and take Helen back to Sparta. Yes, Odysseus was behind the idea of the wooden Trojan horse that was presented to Paris as a gift from the Greeks, but had some warriors hidden in its gigantic belly. And thanks to Odysseus, we have the phrase, be aware of the Greeks bearing gifts. But the hero is also the protagonist of Homer's Odyssey, his Nostos, his homecoming trip to Ithaca, was full of adventures. So what would you say? Shall we start with exploring the epics by starting with Odysseus? Around the 8th century BC, a long epic poem was composed that was meant to be narrated verbally, but was also documented in 24 books. And this epic was actually the sequel of another one named the Iliad. However, it is more than common to narrate the sequel before the prequel of the series. This epic poem is no other than the Odyssey, and it is attributed to the most well-known ancient Greek poet, Homer. The main character of this epic is no other than the witty king of Ithaca, Odysseus, who you may know with his Latin name, Ulysses. The story begins in medias res, meaning that it doesn't follow a linear chronology, but rather begins in the middle of the story, as most films do today. And the very first lines are an invocation to the muse, a prayer that acts as a prologue. Tell me, O oh muse, of the man of many devices, who wandered full many ways after he had sacked the sacred citadel of Troy. Many were the men whose cities he saw, and whose mind he learned, and many the woes he suffered, and his heart upon the sea seeking to win his own life and the return of his comrades. The poet starts saying. In the first four books of the Odyssey, we learn that Odysseus, king of the Greek island of Ithaca in the Ionian Sea, is missing. He was on his way back from Troy, but something happened and he angered God Poseidon. Nobody knows where he is for the last ten years. Back in Ithaca, Queen Penelope and her 20-year-old son, Telemachus, watch passively as their kingdom falls into chaos. A hundred and eight loud drunk men, who wish to someday get anything that belongs to Odysseus, 
can't stop eating and drinking at the courtyard. They are the suitors of Penelope, who avoids them passively, taking her time suing a funeral offering for her father-in-law. They have taken complete advantage of Xenia, the sacred responsibility of the Greeks to accommodate strangers. Hospitality, however, goes both ways. The guests should also be tactful when visiting or staying at someone else's home, something that the suitors have completely overlooked. The father figure, the king of Ithaca, would be the only one that could establish order on the island. His son is approaching adulthood and, although he is angry with the whole situation, he feels powerless. That is when the goddesses of Mount Olympus decided to intervene. Athena, goddess of wisdom and strategy, admired Odysseus for his ingenuity and resourcefulness. As we learn in the Odyssey, the king of Ithaca had come up with the idea of the Trojan horse that had helped the Greeks win against the forces of Paris. And this wouldn't be the first time he would come up with a sneaky plan like this. Athena had already tried to reach Poseidon, but he was absent from Mount Olympus. Her only hope now was Zeus, whom she begged to help the king of Ithaca with his nostos, a Greek word that means homecoming trip. Transformed as a man named Mentis, goddess Athena visited Odysseus' son, Telemachus, and reveals to him that his father is still alive and that he will return to the island soon. That message somehow awakened the young man. Telemachus, in a state of extreme emotions, then looks up to the sky and asks the gods to punish the greedy and rude suitors. Soon enough, two eagles appear in the sky, fighting. The eagle is the symbol of Zeus, and it could be interpreted as a bad omen for the greedy suitors who, of course, choose to ignore it. Athena then transforms herself into Telemachus and finds a ship and a number of skilled seamen who could help him search for his father. Perhaps she could sense that the young prince is still indecisive and needs a bit of a push before he is able to take over any responsibility. Telemachus finally decides to hold an assembly with the citizens of Ithaca, who started mocking him when he mentioned the suitors, as if they don't care about the issue, or perhaps as if they don't think he's capable of fighting against them. The prince then leaves Ithaca with his crew, and Mentor, the man who was responsible to raise him while his father was in Troy. What he didn't know is that, instead of the real Mentor, he travelled with goddess Athena, who had taken the old man's appearance. The first stop was Pylos, where Nestor, Odysseus' friend, resided. But Nestor knew nothing about what may have happened to Odysseus. Telemachus then visited Sparta, the kingdom of Menelaus and Helen, who had returned back from Troy. The couple informs Telemachus that they had heard from Proteus, known as the Old Man of the Sea, that a nymph named Calypso held Odysseus captive. While in Sparta, Telemachus also learns everything that ensued in Troy. He also learns that Menelaus' brother, Agamemnon, was killed by a sneaky coward named Aegisthus. Aegisthus hadn't participated in the war, but had rather stayed in Greece to seduce the queen and become king himself. But the exiled son of Agamemnon, Orestes, took matters into his own hands and killed Aegisthus. Menelaus implies to Telemachus that he should take the example of Orestes. Homer describes with great detail how well-behaved and tactful Telemachus is as a guest, in an attempt, perhaps, to highlight the antithesis with the ill-mannered Odysseus suitors. And this part of the Odyssey ends with a scene from Ithaca. The suitors are plotting to kill Telemachus as soon as he returns home. Penelope overhears their plans and is filled with worry. Athena visits her in the form of her sister and reassures her that everything will be alright in the end. 
In books 5 to 8, Homer takes us to Ogygia, the island of the nymph Calypso in the Maltese archipelago. Willie Odysseus is stranded there for the last seven years, with the nymph being madly in love with him. Calypso had been trying to convince Odysseus that she was much more attractive than Penelope. Although Odysseus did not agree with that statement, the nymph made him feel powerless and he acted as if he was her husband. Thanks to Athena's intervention, the gods of Mount Olympus agreed to help Odysseus return home. Hermes, the messenger god, visits Calypso and orders her to let Odysseus go. However, Calypso is not the only one who wants Odysseus to stay away from his kingdom. Poseidon, the god of the sea, is mad at him and the reason is revealed later. Odysseus is now free to leave Ogygia and with the help of Calypso he builds a raft within four days. With a magical breeze sent by gods, he is able to sail away from what we now know as the Maltese archipelago. But on the seventeenth day of his trip, Poseidon sees him and conjures a storm that tosses Odysseus in the water. The king is almost drowned. With the help of the goddess Inno, also known as Queen of the Sea, and the goddess Athena, he manages to survive and gets a sore. The place he ends up staying is Phaeacia, which is ruled by the king Alcinous, and many scholars believe it is located near the island of Corfu. In Phaeacia, a storm-tossed Odysseus meets Alcinous' daughter, Princess Nafsika. Her female friends are all afraid of him. He doesn't have the appearance of a king, but rather of a man who lives isolated in the wilderness. But Nafsika is instantly attracted to him. The princess wants to lead him to the palace, but is afraid that people will start gossiping if they see him with her. Odysseus is finally led to the palace with the help of Athena, who is in the form of a little girl. At the palace, he is welcomed by Alcinous, who is angered when he learns that his daughter left him to find his way alone. After being bathed, clothed and fed, Odysseus is encouraged to tell his adventures. And that is perhaps when the most interesting part of the epic poem begins. As we learn through his narrations, the king of Ithaca's Nostos had started ten years ago, after the end of the Trojan War. Twelve ships sailed away, and the first stop was the land of the Kikones, which was located in Thraki. But some of Odysseus's crew members started stealing and causing trouble to the locals. Eventually, the local army turned against them. Odysseus lost six men per ship and left as soon as possible. Their next stop was the land of the Lotus Eaters, which is estimated to be located on the northern coast of Africa. The Lotus Eaters are very friendly and peaceful people. However, they lack motivation and ambition. All they want is to eat their beloved lotus fruits all day and all night. The locals offer the lotus fruit to Odysseus and his crew. The fruit was apparently a narcotic and it was very addicting. Odysseus, a very ambitious man, could not bear see his men laying on ground all day, having forgotten their goal of reaching Ithaca. The men did not want to return to their duties on the ship and Odysseus had to organize a literal intervention and force his crew back to their ships. In books 9 to 12, Odysseus continues narrating his stories. He explains how he ended up at the island of the Cyclopes, Cyclops as they are pronounced in English. We sailed hence, always in much distress till we came to the land of the lawless and the inhumane cyclops. Now the cyclops neither plant nor plough, but trust in providence and live on such weed, barley and grapes as grow wild without any kind of tillage, and their wild grapes yield them wine as the sun and the rain may grow them. They have no laws nor assemblies of the people, but live in caves on the tops of high mountains. 
eats is lord and master in his family, and they take no account of their neighbors, Odysseus says. The Cyclops were giants with one enormous eye on their forehead. They were violent and lawless creatures that were not the brightest either. Odysseus and his men explored the land, ate some of the livestock and found a cave that seemed occupied. They wanted to ask for help and enter the cave which was the home of Cyclops Polyphemus. The latter not only denied helping the men, but ate some of them and trapped Odysseus and the rest of his crew in his dark, terrifying home. Little did he know that Odysseus was not only brave, but blessed with the ability to find solutions in the most difficult situations. Willy Odysseus offers some of his wine to Polyphemus and introduces himself. He says his name is Kanenas, which translates to nobody in Greek. Polyphemus soon falls asleep after drinking the wine, and Odysseus finds the opportunity to create a sharp spear from Polyphemus' large club. With the help of his men, he blinds Cyclops Polyphemus, who wakes up, opens the door, and screams for help. This is when the Ithacans manage to escape and run towards their ship. The other Cyclops visited Polyphemus, asking him who hurt him. Nobody, he screamed. The Cyclops get confused and leave Polyphemus alone, thinking he blinded himself. Odysseus and his men were already on their boats, staring and pointing at the giant man who was tricked by a group of tiny humans. Odysseus was ecstatic. He had fought men in Troy, but managing to win against a giant creature like Polyphemus was a great achievement. And that is when he began insulting Polyphemus while sailing away. He was unaware that he had committed an Hebrews, and he was soon going to face the wrath of Poseidon, father of Polyphemus and god of the sea. Poseidon throws an enormous rock at Odysseus that nearly hits his boat. Odysseus is now cursed to never return home, at least alive. Odysseus and his crew manage to reach the island of the wind, where Aeolus, the god of the winds, resides. Aeolia was located close to Sicily, and Aeolus was very kind and hospitable towards Odysseus and his crew. The Ithacans stayed there for one month, and before they sailed away, Aeolus gifted Odysseus a bag containing winds that could help them reach Ithaca faster. With the westerlies at their back, the boats start approaching Ithaca within just ten days. Odysseus stared at the starry night over Ithaca, knowing he would step foot on his beautiful kingdom, probably within a day and he fell asleep peacefully on the dock. Some of his men, though, could not sleep that night. What was in Eolos' bag? Did it contain winds or treasures? What if Eolos had given gold to the sails and the latter did not want to sail? These greedy men decided to open the bag, just like Pandora opened the box, containing all evils. The winds were forceful. They created a hurricane, and they led the boats back to Eolia, with Theolos speculating that Odysseus' journey is somehow cursed. He explained that there is nothing more he could do. The Ithacans then start sailing without any wind, and they soon reach Lamos, a place that was inhabited by a group of aggressive cannibals called Lestrigonians. The cannibals attacked and ate many of Odysseus' men, the Ithacans ran back into their boats in horror. However, the hungry cannibals started throwing rocks at them. The rocks destroyed all ships but one. Odysseus and the rest of the survivors managed to escape by paddling faster than ever. The next stop was the island of a witch named Kirki. The men were terrified to search for the inhabitants after everything they had experienced. But Odysseus sent some of his men to follow a smoke trail that was coming from the depths of the woods. The men found a home that was guarded by wolves and mountain lions. A woman was singing inside the house. 
She invites them inside, welcomes them and prepares a feast just for them. But little did they know that she was a witch. The men start eating and drinking like pigs, except for one sailor, Evrilokos, who was hesitant towards strangers after witnessing his mates being consumed by giants. Suddenly, the men start turning into pigs. Their drinks were spiked with a potion that Kirki had prepared. Evrilokos then goes to Odysseus and informs him about everything that had happened. Odysseus visits Kirki and threatens her that he will kill her unless he takes her hex back. Kirki explains that the curse will break only if Odysseus spends a night with her, a proposal that the king of Ithaca found quite fair. But Odysseus ended up spending an entire year at Kirki's island, which had turned into a paradise for him and his men. Eventually, the Ithacans realize that it is time to go home. Odysseus asks Kirki to help them return to Ithaca, and she reveals that, in order to break the curse that they somehow got, he would have to visit Hades, the kingdom of the dead, and speak with Tiresias, a fortune teller and prophet. She explains that he would have to go there, and protect himself from the bloodthirsty souls of the dead. Following Kirki's advice, he and his crew sail away towards a place that is known as the land of Chimerians, where the men of winter reside. There, he follows Kirki's instructions and performs a ritual that would open the veil between the land of the living and the land of the dead. The area was surrounded by thick fog. He performs the ritual, which involved sacrificing animals and offering milk and honey. He was warned that if he did not feed the dead, they would try to drink his own blood. From the pit he had dug, countless souls appeared and started to consume the offerings. Odysseus came across many people he had met in his life, including his dead mother. But the Ithacan king had to sit far away until fortune teller Tiresias appeared. All of a sudden, Theban Tiresias comes forward. Son of Laertes sprang from Zeus, Odysseus of many devices. What now happens, hopeless man? Why have you left the light of the sun and come here to behold the dead and a region where there is no joy? No, give place from the pit and draw back the sharp sword, that I may drink of the blood and tell you sooth, he said. Tiresias tells Odysseus that he should not touch the flocks of Helios when he lands on Thrinacia, and he predicts that he will manage to kill Penelope's suitors when he finally reaches Thaka. Tiresias also consoles Odysseus to make a sacrifice to Poseidon once he reaches the land where the people do not know of the sea. This is the only way to appease the god of the sea and live a trouble-free life. Tiresias then allows Andiclia to drink from the blood and finally talk with her son. Odysseus had left Ithaca knowing that his mother was alive. He was unaware she was dead. Andiclia explained that she couldn't bear waiting for her son's return and her worries killed her. Odysseus tries to hug her, but she vanishes into thin air. The souls of the dead start surrounding Odysseus, telling him their stories of how they died, and the king of Ithaca starts running away from the pit and sails away with his crew. Their first stop was again Kirki's island to make a funeral pyre for the soul of Elpinor. One of the crew members who died there, but hadn't received a proper burial, and his soul had appeared in front of them in Himeria. Kirki then warns them of a great danger they might face during the trip. At Helios Island, the Ithacans might come across the Sirens. This dangerous creature lure sailors with their beautiful voices, and then consume them. Contrary to popular belief, the sirens are not mermaids, they are gigantic birds with women's faces. 
The Ithakans were advised to wear earplugs and therefore never listen to the irresistible song of the sirens. And that's what they did. But Odysseus was very curious and wanted to have this experience before settling to Ithaca. So he didn't wear the earplugs, but asked his sailors to tie him to the mast and commanded them to not listen to him or untie him until they are far away from the sirens. The sailors soon noticed the rocky island. They tied Odysseus to the mast, put some wax in their ears, and start paddling faster than ever. The bloodthirsty monsters tried seducing the men with their beautiful voices, asking them to make a stop on their island. Odysseus was begging them for mercy. He was asking his crew to untie him and let him swim towards these magical and seductive women. But his sailors could not listen to him. After some time that felt like an eternity, they were able to sail away from the sirens and finally untie their leader. The next obstacle they had to surpass was a pass between Scylla and Haribdis. These two deadly sea monsters had caused countless deaths in the sea. In the narrow pass that was located between Sicily and Calabria, there was Scylla, a six-headed dog-like creature that would eat sailors, and on the other side there would be Haribdis, a monster that lived under a small rock and created whirlpools that sunk any nearby boats. Odysseus had to make a difficult decision here. Which option was the least dangerous for him and his crew? He realized that by avoiding Haribdis and approaching Scylla, he would lose fewer men. Haribdis would sink the entire ship, whereas Scylla could only eat few men at a time. That was a sacrifice he had to make. The crew passed by Scylla and Odysseus tells his men to not fear. The monster managed to eat six men to the horror of everyone. But the crew managed to stay focused and sailed away, approaching the island of Helios. Tiresias and Kirki had warned Odysseus to not eat the animals on that island. Zeus would be enraged. However, the winds were not in their favor and the crew remained stranded on the island for some time. There was almost no food left and some of the men decided to eat the cattle of Helios without asking of Odysseus' permission. That action enraged Zeus, who conjured a storm and targeted Odysseus' ship with a thunderbolt, wrecking it. The men fell into the water, and the enormous waves managed to separate them from each other. Odysseus grabbed onto a floating piece of wood and watched the waves take him towards the whirlpool of Haribdis, but the lucky Thakan managed to escape once again, and after passing by Scylla, he ended up in Calypso's island. And this is when Odysseus ends his story, thanking Alcinous for his hospitality. It is time for him to get on board and leave Phaeacia. And that's when the 13th book of the Odyssey starts, this time in present time. The Ithacan king is seen narrating his adventures in front of the people of Phaeacia. The hospital islanders sympathize with Odysseus and they offer him a boat ride home, along with various gifts and resources. Odysseus thanks King Alcinous and the rest of the Phaeacians and gets on board. The boat finally arrives at Ithaca the next day while Odysseus is asleep. The Phaeacians leave him on shore and depart, but Poseidon notices what they did and he is filled with anger. After asking permission from Zeus, he turns the Phaeacian ship into stone, and just before they arrived into the harbor, the ship sinks and the Phaeacians who helped Odysseus are never seen again. King Alcinous realized that helping Odysseus enraged the gods and swore to never help strangers ever again. At the same time, King Odysseus wakes up and finds himself on a land he could not recognize. Goddess Athena appears in front of him as a shepherd and explains to him that he is indeed in Ithaca and that his people need him. 
Odysseus at first tries to conceal his identity, but the goddess reveals hers and advises him to use his tricks to eradicate the suitors who conspire against him and his son. To protect him, she transforms him into an old man and leaves Ithaca to go find Telemachus in the Peloponnese region. The transformed king of Ithaca follows Athena's advice and hides into a hut that belongs to Evmeus, a local farmer and loyal friend of Odysseus. There he meets Evmeus, who not only feeds the transformed Odysseus, but confesses to him how much he misses the king of Ithaca. Odysseus promises Evmeus that his beloved king will return. He narrates a different story regarding his background and finally learns that his son is in danger. Once the night arrives, Odysseus sleeps in the hut and Evmeus tends to his herd. Finally, in book 15 and 16, we have the reunion of Telemachus and Odysseus. While Odysseus sleeps, goddess Athena takes Telemachus back from the Peloponnese to Ithaca. She warns him of the dangers he might face and suggests Telemachus that he visits Evmeus first. As he leaves, an eagle flies off holding its prey. Is this a sign? Back in the hut, Odysseus learns about the death of his mother and how lonely his father is. Evmeus then narrates his own story, how he was abducted by pirates when he was a child and how King Laertes raised him as his child. While the farmer narrated his story, Telemachus arrived on the island. The young prince of Ithaca reached the hut where he, gr was, where he was greeted by both men. Odysseus soon understands that his son does not feel confident enough to stand against the suitors. But with Athena's intervention, Odysseus regained his appearance and revealed the true identity to his son. The two men embrace and cry together. Father and son spend the whole night talking and coming up with the right plan that can help them regain power over their kingdom. In the last books of the Odyssey, order is brought to Ithaca. Telemachus visits the palace of Ithaca and meets his mother. She embraces him and asks whether he was able to collect any news regarding Odysseus. But he doesn't reveal the truth. And that is when Theoclymenus enters the scene. He is a prophet from Argos who was wanted for committing murder. The fugitive had sought refuge in Telemachus' boat and ended up in Ithaca. He revealed that he had seen Odysseus on the island, but Penelope did not believe him. It was almost night time when the suitors visited the palace to dine and drink wine. They used to eat and drink at the palace every night, along with Penelope's maids. The queen of Ithaca was feeling helpless and unable to bring order to the kingdom. Everything was in chaos. What the suitors did not know was that Odysseus was dressed up as a beggar and walking towards his kingdom, along with Evmeus. A man named Melanthios sees him and taunts him for his appearance, and what follows is the most iconic part of Homer's Odyssey. Odysseus's dog, Argos, was spotted laying nearby. The dog was very old at that time. He was able to recognize his master immediately and started wagging his tail, but he was unable to run to Odysseus. Due to his excitement and old age, he died at the scene. The friendship between a dog and a man was considered sacred since ancient times. Odysseus finally entered the palace and pretending he is a beggar, he started asking for money from the thousands of suitors. Some even threw bread at him. The king then starts narrating a story, how he used to be rich. Antinous, one of the suitors, hits him on the shoulder and Odysseus, still disguised as a beggar, asks the gods to punish him. He doesn't attack yet. His journey has taught him a lot and he has paid for his hebris. The king and prince of Ithaca start hiding their weapons in the palms once the suitors go to sleep. They will use them tomorrow to scare away then kill them. Once they are done, Odysseus visits Penelope in her chamber. The faithful queen does not recognize her husband. She asks him to narrate his story. 
and the man explains his past is too painful. But she was feeling too familiar towards him, and she started discussing her own problems and how powerful she feels against the suitors. Perhaps she will have to pick a suitor the next day as her husband. Odysseus then starts narrating a story to Penelope that he is from Crete and that he had hosted Odysseus during his homecoming trip. The queen cries and promises to host the man in her palace. The man promises that Odysseus is alive and on his way back, but Penelope does not believe this scenario. Evriclia, Penelope's most loyal maid, cleans the host's feet, following the rules of Philoxenia. She immediately recognized Odysseus from a hunting wound on his thigh, and Odysseus warns her to not reveal his identity. Penelope then asks for Odysseus's advice. She dreamt of an eagle that preys on geese in her kingdom. The eagle talks to her and says he is Odysseus and the geese are no other than the suitors. Odysseus says he believes that the dream will come true, but Penelope is skeptical. When the beggar insists that Odysseus will come back, she runs to her chamber in tears. She asks for goddess Artemis to end her life. The next morning, Penelope gathers the suitors in the main hall and announces them that she will marry one of them. She explains that the new king of Ithaca will be the man who will be able to shoot an arrow through twelve axe heads with Odysseus's bow. The suitors fail one by one, and then beggar Odysseus asks to give it a try. The suitors laugh, but Penelope allows him to use the bow, promising that she will give him food and clothes if he succeeds. Telemachus, knowing what is about to follow, leads her into the house. And Evmeus makes sure that the doors are locked. Odysseus succeeds, and at the same time, a lightning strikes, a sign that Zeus is with Odysseus' side once more. What follows is that Odysseus starts throwing his arrows at Antinous, the vilest of the suitors. With Athena's help, Odysseus and Telemachus defeat the suitors one by one and make sure that the maids that were disloyal to the king are punished as well. Evriclia, the old maid, informs Penelope about Odysseus's return and the death of the suitors. Penelope is doubting the scenario, but then Odysseus enters her room and reveals his true identity. Penelope is still hesitant, but Odysseus talks about the bed which he had carved himself from an olive tree and that has its roots in the foundation of the house. This bed cannot be moved, just like the couple's faith and loyalty to each other. The secret that only he and she knew was enough to make Penelope believe that her husband was alive and standing in front of her. She hugs him and apologizes to him for her skepticism. Now there are two things left to do a sacrifice to god Poseidon, and a visit to the vineyards of Laertes, Odysseus's old father. Odysseus meets his father, they embrace, and make sure that Poseidon will favor him again. He visits the mainland holding the winnowing oar and makes a sacrifice when he meets the first person who is unaware of the sea and seamen. As for the suitors, they end up in Hades, and their loss divides the people of Ithaca. With Athena's intervention, peace is declared, and the Ithacans follow Odysseus, their true king, the one who is favored by the gods. Odysseus came across several obstacles, including the sirens. He was captured by charming witches, he was offered fruits with narcotic effects, and even got proposed to by a beautiful princess but he stayed focused on his goal to return to his kingdom. And we can all agree that Odysseus is perhaps the hero we can all aspire to be. By staying away from vices and being persistent on our goals, regardless of how many obstacles we face, this is the only way to ensure happiness in our later years. A great theme of the Odyssey is of course the topic of hybris and how excessive pride can destroy someone's life and cast them away from what is truly meaningful, such as their family. Another theme is hospitality. 
a sacred ritual for ancient Greeks and an important tradition for modern Greeks. The Odyssey reminds us that reciprocity is important. Xenia goes both ways for the guests and the hosts. Lastly, Odysseus teaches us that heroism comes in different forms. Using words, diplomacy, and even tricks is sometimes wiser when trapped in a dangerous situation. If, for example, a powerful witch is in love with you and has entrapped you, manipulating her emotions to make her feel empathetic towards you might be wiser than a full-on attack with a sword. And if you encounter a huge, gigantic enemy with low IQ, such as a cyclope, you should use the only thing that is to your advantage, your brain, rather than your physical powers. One of the most underrated ancient Greek heroes is Jason, the prince of Ialkos and husband of the witch Media, who you might know from the ancient Greek tragedy with the same name. Jason is the hero of the myth of the Argonauts, the sailors of the legendary ship named Argo, and the main character of the epic poem Argonautica by Apollonius Rhodius. Jason was the son of Aeson, king of the city of Iolcos in Thessaly, and God's Hermit's blood ran in his family. Jason was raised by wise Hiron, and he was taught hunting, music, and medicine. As soon as the prince started approaching adulthood, he visited his birthplace to announce to his uncle Peleus that he was now ready to sit on his throne. Peleus immediately remembered a prophecy he had heard many years ago. He had been warned by an oracle that a man with one sandal would try to dethrone him. When the young man approached him, he looked at his feet. This man named Jason was wearing only one sandal. The other was lost while he was trying to help an older woman who was actually God's hero dressed as a peasant. The cunning king knew him as be strategic. The cunning king knew him as be strategic and not infuriate Jason. Otherwise, he would risk getting killed. To take my throne with you, Sal, you must go in a quest to find the golden fleece, he said, knowing that the task would be impossible to complete. But what is the golden fleece exactly? In Greek, it is called the golden fleece was the fleece, obviously, of a mythical golden wooled flying ram. The ram was called Chrysomalos, meaning golden hair, and was sent by Poseidon to save a prince named Phrixus, who was going to be sacrificed to end the drought in his kingdom. Chrysomalos, the flying ram, brought Phrixus to Colchis an area at the coast of the Black Sea. According to the legend, Phrixus sacrificed the ram to Poseidon, as it was intended. Then he hung the ram's tiny fleece from a tree, which was guarded by a serpent. Whoever was able to attain it would be able to lead any city. As for the spirit of Chrysomalos, it is said that the animal became a constellation that it represents the sign of Faris in Greek astrology. Jason was intrigued by the idea of traveling to a foreign land to obtain a status symbol. He didn't want to be offered the throne so easily. Like other ancient Greek heroes, he wanted to prove his worth. And this is how the quest to call his started. Prince Jason gathered some of the bravest, strongest, most disciplined and smartest men and women from all over Greece, including Heracles and Atalanta. He then made sure that he and his 49 men would travel with the safest and fastest ship that was ever created. According to Apollonius Rhodius, the builder Argus constructed the Argo with the help of God Athena. Argo is still one of the most legendary ships of all time, and it is said 
to have flied over the skies and turned into a constellation. Thanks to its clever design and great weather conditions, that ship took the men safely to the island of Limnos. There, the Argonauts learned that all the male residents of the island have been killed. The local women revealed that they were angered by the fact that the men were unfaithful to them and had abducted women from Thraki to keep them as slaves. It was later revealed that goddess Aphrodite was to blame. The goddess of romance and beauty was forgotten by the Limnian women, who paid no tribute to her, and that is why she decided to make the local men look for women elsewhere. The only man who was spared from the wrath of the Limnian women was King Thoas, whose daughter could not bear the idea of killing him. His daughter was no other than Ipsipili. The young woman was immediately attracted to Prince Tatian, who ended up getting pregnant by him, and the crew ended up impregnating the entire female population of the island, then departed and continued their quest. If you are aware of the tragedy called Mythia, then you should know that Jason had commitment issues when it comes to relationships. Argos' next stop was the Arctonisos or Bear Island, which is basically an island in the Sea of Marmara, known as Propontis. This area connects the Black Sea to the Aegean Sea, and it is rich in marble. The Bear Island was ruled by King Kuzikus, a hospitable, amicable man, who made sure that Jason and his crew members had a comfortable stay at his palace. The king wanted to warn the Argonauts to avoid sailing to the eastern side of the island, since they were constantly getting attacked by the Pelasgians and his army, and his army was always guarding the east coast. However, he ended up getting distracted and forgot to mention this important detail. After the Argonauts departed, a storm started. The men ended up on the east coast of Bear Island, where they were attacked by the army of Kuzikus. The latter thought that they were approached by enemies, and the Argonauts were unaware that they had ended up at the same island. Jason and his crew killed the majority of Kuzikus' soldiers, and Kuzikus himself. When they realized what was going on, it was way too late. The Argonauts were quick to judge the situation. The Argonauts left the island only after mourning the dead and paying for a costly burial for Kuzikus and his army. Kuzikus' son took over the island and the Argonauts sailed to Mysia in Asia Minor. According to some sources, Hercules was left in Mysia. He was either lured there by Nymphs and never returned to Argo, or according to the historian Ferekidis, the simp complained about his weight and asked him to disembark. The most interesting variation of the story is, however, that Hercules stayed on the island after his lover Hylas fell in love with a local nymph. In any case, Jason was extremely sad that one of his bravest men chose a different path. Argos next stop was the land of Verviges. The people there were not very friendly. Their king, Amikos, challenged one of them to a boxing match and, for the first time in history, the king lost. The Argonauts managed to leave the island before they got slaughtered by the local army. The Argonauts were able to surpass many challenges during their trip to Colchis. One of their greatest achievements was carrying away the Harpies from the home of King Phineus. The latter was a cursed prophet who was not only blinded by Zeus, but was hunted down by some terrifying birds called Harpies. After helping him, the man warned... Uh, after helping him, Phineus warned the Argonauts of the Simpligades, the terrifying rocks of the Bosporus that were clashing together every time a boat would try to pass by. When the Argo approached the clashing rocks of Bosporus, Jason released a dove. He wanted to see how fast they would have to go to cross the stream successfully. The bird flew between the cliffs and the rocks managed to cut only a small part of its tails. The Argonauts used all of their strength and also managed to go through the rocks by only sacrificing a small part of the stern ornament. 
From that moment on, the Simply Galvez stopped moving. The Argonauts continued their journey and encountered many obstacles as they, as they, were, appro as they were approaching what was believed to be the edge of the world. They lost some of their men from wild boars and mysterious diseases. They encountered the Stymphalian birds and managed to scare them away with their growling sounds. They also offered a helping hand to four Cypric brothers who warned them about the terrifying serpent that protects the golden flints. With the winds in their favor, the Argonauts arrived to Colchis, where the sacred grove of Iris was located. They soon came across a beautiful palace. Four fountains could be found in the courtyard, surrounded by vines and beautiful flowers. They were gassing water, milk, wine and aromatic oils, respectively. That was the home of King Aetis, who was standing there next to his beautiful daughter, Midia. Tatian had been debating over the past few days which strategy he should follow to obtain the shiny fleece. He believed in his powers, and if he started a fight, he could win. However, all these days traveling around the world had taught him a lot. Success can be achieved with the power of persuasion. Violence is not always necessary to get what you want. Jason came to call his in peace. He accompanied the four Cypric siblings to the palace and was hosted there by the king Aetis himself. Meanwhile, goddess Athena and goddess Hera were plotting how to get princess Medea fall in love with him, which would eventually help the hero persuade the king of Colchis. Eros, the Greek version of Cupid, was persuaded to shoot the arrow of romantic love to Medea, who instantly developed feelings for the prince of Iolcos. Jason knew that to persuade someone, you need to gain their trust. He was a stranger in Aetis' eyes, and it would take forever to make him like him. However, he ended up using one of his good deeds to his favor. It was revealed that the brothers he had saved were the king's grandsons. The eldest of the young men started narrating how he and his brothers were going to die until Jason and his crew found them and rescued them. He then proceeded to tell the king that Jason has lost his throne in Ilkos and he needs to obtain the fleece and take his rightful place. Although these words were coming from his grandson and not Jason himself, Aetis became enraged. How could someone ask for the most precious item of his kingdom? But Jason stayed calm. He didn't take things personally. Instead, he started complimenting Aetis and telling him that he would be willing to pay a price forgetting the fleece. Not only that, but Iolcos would be forever grateful to him. He would be known for his generosity in his kingdom and beyond. Aetis started thinking about his options. He could detect Jason's efforts to persuade him, but he didn't feel like ordering his execution anymore. Instead, the king of Colchis promised him that he would offer him the fleece only if he completed a series of impossible tasks just like Hercules' labors. To begin with, Jason would have to yoke a pair of fire-breathing oxen and plow the field. Then he would have to plant dragon's teeth in the soil and fight off the skeletons that would sprout. The final task would be to destroy the mighty dragon that guarded the fleece. The king believed that Jason would, re the king believed that Jason would reject the proposal. It would be a win-win situation. Tatian was indeed overwhelmed by all the tasks, and although he was a confident and brave individual, he was also reasonable. He knew that it would be impossible to complete these tasks. But given the circumstances and the fact that without the fleece he would be assassinated by Peleus, he accepted the challenge. What he did not know was that two goddesses were on his side and that Medea, the princess of Colchis possessed magic abilities and she was also madly in love with him. The young woman spent the night with her maidens gathering herbs and other items to prepare a charm that would protect Jason from harm's way. She then approached him and told him that if he agrees to marry her, she will give him a charm that would protect him from fire and bronze. Jason agreed. 
the prince of Yolkos and leader of the Argonauts, and peered in front of Aetis, the people of Colchis and his crew members. They would all watch him complete the impossible tasks. Since only him and Media knew about the charms, the audience was left in shock while watching him approach the first ox, which started breathing fire. Jason was not harmed by the flames since he was protected by the charm. He was able to plow the field and then planted the seeds that were given to him. But these were not normal seeds, they were dragon's teeth. And all of a sudden, skeletons started digging themselves out of the soil, forming an army. Jason followed Media's instructions and threw a rock at the skeletons, who got disoriented. The blight skeletons started fighting each other, and Jason was standing there watching them destroy themselves. After Aetis watched Jason complete the impossible tasks, he panicked. He could feel that he could destroy the dragon and run away with the golden fleece. Aetis ordered his army to destroy Ergo. But Mithia then did the unthinkable. This wouldn't be the first time she would commit such an act. But you have to remember that she was blinded by Eros. She was obsessed with Jason and would do anything to help him. Mithia killed her brother to distract her father from destroying Argo and help the Argonauts escape. At that time, Jason ran towards the sacred grove of Ares, threw Midia's poisonous potion at the dragon, and stole the golden fleece. Other sources mention that Midia sank a lullaby to the dragon and put him to sleep, a concept that we may have seen in the first Harry Potter book. Going back to Yolkos was not an easy task, and the Argonauts had to avoid the sirens, Kirki, Scylla and Harivis, just like Odysseus in Homer's Odyssey. The Argonauts also faced Talos, a bronze robot-like guard of the island of Crete, but Mithia played a crucial role in helping the crew survive the trip. Without her magic spells and potions, fetching the fleece and going back to Yolkos would be a deadly task. Unfortunately, Jason and Mithia were not able to rule the city of Yolkos. Peleus refused to offer his throne and Media did another atrocious act. She promised the daughters of Peleus that their father would get much younger and live much longer if they cooked him in a pot just like a lamb. Media would use her magic herbs to revive him, which she never did. The couple was chased away from Yolkos and found refuge in Corinth. The tragedies never ended for them. However, the ending of the story is the topic of a tragedy a theatrical play. There are many themes found in the Argonautica, and the most obvious is that of power and how it can blind people and motivate them into doing the impossible possible. At the same time, we can see how humans are unwilling to give their powerful position to someone who is more capable than them. Another theme that is present in the Argonautica is that of the art of persuasion. Every ancient Greek hero has a set of qualities that make them stand out. They are all brave and strong, but this is not enough to move forward in life. Odysseus was witty and was able to trick others to get himself out of difficult situations. Jason appears to be a person who chooses his battles. He knows that violence can be unnecessary sometimes, and that you can get yourself out of difficult situations by complimenting others and being diplomatic. Of course, nothing would be possible if Media hadn't fallen in love with him, proving that the greatest charm you can cast on someone is make them fall in love with you. Once Eros suits his arrows, you have the person under your control. As we could see from the Odyssey and the Argonautica, ancient Greek heroes were not flawless. They made a lot of mistakes and they had to overcome many obstacles to reach their goals, although they could give up and live easy but uninteresting lives. Odysseus could have stayed with the Lotus Eaters till he died, or Jason could have denied Peleus's offer and he could have never have left to call his. The reason so many myths are focused on heroes and heroines is because they are much more similar to us. We can relate to them and follow their example. 
After all, to become a hero, you don't necessarily need an adamantine sword or winged sandals. Learning to choose your battles, staying focused and disciplined, being persuasive, brave, grounded and hospitable are all things humans can do and transform their lives from ordinary to epic.